You are listening to Live from Lord North Street, a podcast from the Institute of Economic Affairs. I'm Kate Andrews, news editor at the IEA. Today I'm speaking to the IEA's research director, Dr. Jamie White, about Oxfam's yearly report on global inequality. Writing in the Times today, Jamie lambasts the poverty relief charity for opposing the policies that help people at the bottom rise out of absolute poverty. He expands on his criticisms and analysis here. If you like what you hear, be sure to subscribe to our iTunes channel, IEA Conversations. Jamie, Oxfam's report on inequality is out today. It comes out every year. It gets a lot of attention. Uh, The headlines and the statistics are actually quite shocking. It leads with this idea that more than 80% of new global wealth goes to the top 1%, while the poorest half get nothing. Um, In particular, they claim that 42 people own the same wealth as the poorest 50%. I mean, that is really, those are quite shocking numbers. So what can we make of this? It sounds sensational, but it's really the result of a a quite uh, obvious fact, an unsurprising fact, which is that the vast majority of the world's population, and certainly the bottom half, have very little uh, net worth. That was the case all through history. Many, many more people have uh, net worth now than they used to. But still, you know, many people in developing countries, especially and the very poor and better off countries, uh, accumulate very little worth over the over the course of their lives. So, if you add it all up, that total bottom half, it's not a terribly big figure. So, when you then look at the the wealth of the very wealthiest people, the billionaires, of course, you don't need that many billionaires. Uh, to get to the same number, 42 in this case, it's claimed. But to understand kind of how silly this all is in a way, uh, imagine that you followed a policy that perhaps Oxfam would favor, which is to confiscate all of the money of those top 42 people and give it to the people in the bottom half. Well, how much better off do you think the people in the bottom half would be? Most people would assume extremely better off. Yeah, I think that's what they would assume. But in in fact, all that would have happened is that they would have doubled their worth, of course, because of the way things are calculated. And that doubling would amount to an increase of 750 US dollars. So they'd be worth 750 US dollars more. That's not an increase in their income. That's a one-off payment. You can only do it once. Yeah, it happens once. You'll never do it again, that's for sure, because no one's going to accumulate those billions again, are they? Because if they know it's going to be confiscated. But, but it's a one-off payment of $750. That's it. Uh, wouldn't really change their lives at all. I mean, for the very poorest, uh, $750 you could spend it on, you might get a really rudimentary kind of a dwelling in some really, really poor places. But on the whole, uh, you know, they maybe... Couldn't, they couldn't rely on the income coming in again. No, it's, it's yeah. one-off. Uh, so th- you see, it's a kind of a trick of numbers. If you were more open about what we're talking about here, that it's, a sem- it's $750 per person in the bottom half, no one would be that surprised to discover that the top 50 billionaires have as much all put together. It's really just, all it really points to, which everybody I think should have already known, was that the bottom half of the world's population don't have much net worth. That that 42 figure, that's including net debt. Now, Oxfam has also calculated excluding net debt, and actually the figure's still quite small, something like 128 people. Um, But, you know, including net debt is kind of like suggesting that the Harvard graduate who's now got university loans to pay is actually in a worse position than the rural Chinese farmer. Why are they including these in the first place? Why not just go with the 128 figure? Well, it was a mistake to include them in the first place. They I think do it every year. That's right. <laughs> uh, well, it depends why people have got net debt. Uh, you know, And almost always when you've got net debt, it's because it's funded an asset that is worth a lot. Otherwise, you couldn't have got that net debt. I mean, so the people who have net debt are often people at the early stages of a business or students, as you say, someone with a Harvard degree, let's say. The reason people were willing to lend them money so that they could be in a net debt position is that they expected whatever activities the debt was funding would in the future lead to an income that could repay that debt. That's that's the idea. It doesn't always come off and the bank sometimes loses the money, but on the whole, it does. In a way, what Oxfam's getting wrong here isn't so much uh, the inclusion of the debt. It's the failure to recognize the value of the asset that the debt has funded. So it's true that uh, a Harvard graduate has a huge, say, from law school, has a very high debt. But they also have an asset worth a lot, namely a law degree from From Harvard. Harvard. Uh, And what they're not counting, what Oxfam isn't counting, is the value of that law degree from uh, Harvard. In fact... 
their methodology in general is, is more made problematic by their failure to count assets than by a wrongful inclusion of debts. I mean, if you're not going to count the assets, you should exclude the debts that funded them. But there are all sorts of cases where there are assets that weren't funded by debts, and they don't count them either. Let me give you a, a very concrete example. If you are uh, a 65-year-old about to retire in Singapore, you will probably have a pension pot a fund with which to buy an annuity, that's to say a regular stream of income payments, uh, of around, you know, over, over a million uh, US dollars. The Singaporeans have a compulsory private savings scheme, and most Singaporeans retire with a large amount of money in their pension fund. Now, that gets counted by Oxfam. They say you've got a million US dollars there in a pension fund. If you are a, a Finnish 65 year old about to retire, you probably don't have any money in a private pension fund because they have a more generous state pension in Finland. Now, the Finnish person is counted by Oxfam as having no, no money in that regard. Yet, they are going to receive an income for the rest of their life, uh, just like the person from Singapore is. The system in Finland effectively guarantees you an income. Now, that is wealth. Anything that guarantees you an income is a kind of wealth. And again, the Oxfam methodology doesn't pick up on that. So there are many, many cases uh, where the measure is somewhat inaccurate. But I don't want to really get hung up on the, on the measure. There is a great inequality in wealth in the world. Uh, so let's not, let's not quibble about the numbers. Uh, I agree that with, with Oxfam, uh, broadly speaking, about the facts. Um, but, the, the, but so what? The big dispute is the solutions that are put forward to address it. So, yeah, let's let's get a little broader on this. Um, I want to start by talking about the concept of wealth and the fact that groups like Oxfam treat it as if it's a zero-sum game, as, a, as if there's a fixed pot of wealth out there and someone on high is choosing to distribute a lot to the top and nothing to the bottom. If you look at some of the quotes from the Oxfam press release, I'm just going to read a few out here. 82% um, of wealth generated last year across the world went to the richest 1% of the global population. The uh, quote from Mark Goldring, Oxfam's Great Britain chief executive, says something is very wrong with the global economy that allows the 1% to enjoy the lion's share of e increases in wealth. These words are suggesting that this is being done to people. Yeah, well, there's a kind of um, image there in those quotes of wealth being uh, created in some kind of great collective way, and then there's a pool of it that's been collectively created, and somehow this 1% are, are laying their hands on it and thereby depriving the other people who would, uh, would otherwise have got it. That's the kind of vision. Uh, now, to what extent an economy really is like that? Uh, well, I mean, it is like that in little bits and pieces sometimes. I mean, sometimes a whole bunch of people work together on a project and they may be equal partners and, and then it's like that. But it, it's ludicrous to say that it's like that at a national level. It's not even like that at a city level. I mean, so certainly not a global level. And globally, it's just preposterous. I mean, these are people, many of the poorest people in the world are entirely cut off from the rest of the world's population uh, in, in commercial terms and in any other terms. And so the idea that somehow they are, we're all contributing to some common pot of wealth and some of us are, are stealing a bit of it uh, is just a, a misunderstanding of what's going on. But, I mean, this leads us directly, I think, to the, the main point here, which is what really matters? It, it, does equality really matter? Uh, and I, I think a, just a little imaginary situation is useful to understand this. I think Milton Friedman talked about this once, even though I've never actually read it. Just imagine a little archipelago of islands, and they are all cut off from each other. You know, they don't, the, the inhabitants don't know one another. But it's, um, let's say it's within a single legal, it's a single country. Fiji is a good example. There are loads and loads of little islands. Now, by the reckoning of Oxfam, if the inhabitants on one of the islands make some kind of economic breakthrough, they find a better way of fishing or something, or they build new building techniques and they get better houses, they're getting wealthier. Uh, the people on the other island who haven't done this, they're getting relatively, you know, the gap's growing between them. Well, and this is bad. Oxfam will lament this. This is something bad has happened here. Well, what bad thing has happened? One group of people is no worse off than they were. The other group of people are better off. Welfare in the world's improved. 
uh, inequality doesn't seem to me to be of any real concern whatsoever. I mean, if you're a terribly envious person, it may bother you when you see uh, other people with more money. But, you know, I'm not, I don't want to change the world for the sake of the envious. If you don't think that the rich are getting richer at the expense of the poor, then the mere fact of inequality is nothing to lament. And in a free market, you can't get rich at the expense of other people because they don't have to do business with you. You can't force them around. You, they only do business with you if they think that they're benefiting from doing so. Countries that aren't always as free and, frankly, have much more government intervention into their economies, I'm thinking of ex extreme examples like, say, the Soviet Union or Cuba, that is where wealthy people do get their wealth at the expense of the poor. Yes, and there's a serious debate to be had about the extent to which such things go on in Western countries. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, they do to some extent. I, I would say that the financial sector prior to the financial crisis was something of a rigged market because they were effectively protected by government guarantees and they could take bigger risks than they otherwise would have and they could get bigger short-term payouts than they otherwise would have. And a lot of people got rich on the back mm -hmm. of a system that was somewhat rigged. But by and large, I think it's, we still live in a relatively free market economy. And most people can get rich only by providing goods and services that other people value. So the fact that they've become rich is a sign not that they've harmed society, but that they've benefited it. So the mere fact of inequality, uh, I don't think, should concern people terribly. What I think is right and proper to be concerned about, and Oxfam claims to be concerned about, is the welfare of the poorest people. And this is a crucial distinction, probably the most important point, in the sense that inequality and poverty cannot be used as synonyms. They are fundamentally different issues, and we need different anecdotes to address them. Right, and it's a, it's a serious question about whether or not they're connected, and if they are connected, what the direction of the connection is. So, is reducing inequality more likely to help or harm the poor? Uh, I mean, there's a very strong argument that I um, believe in, which is that for why the poor matter more than the rich, because the welfare of the poor can be so much more greatly improved by reasonably modest gains in income. So we ought to be very concerned about the welfare of the poorest people in the world. And this is where Oxfam bewilders me, because the system that they object to, the kind of economic approach they object to so much, which we might call neoliberalism, or it was called the Washington Consensus for a while, which has been the kind of dominant model, was the dominant model between 1980 and the financial crisis. I think it's under threat now, but during that period, it was clearly the dominant model. Well, that during that period, we have seen great accumulations of wealth at the top. We have seen an increase in the number of billionaires and in the wealth of the billionaires. We've simultaneously seen the greatest ever reduction in poverty known in history. I mean, it has been stunning. In 1980, 40% of the world's population lived in absolute poverty. That's to say they lived on $2 a day or less using that's today's $2. 40% in 1980. Today, I think it's at 8%. It's fallen that far and that fast, and it's going down. It's continuing to go down. And it looks like it will effectively be eradicated within in about a decade, which is it's stunning phenomenon and something to be celebrated. And it has coincided with the economic model that generated the billionaires as well. Okay, you could argue it's just a coincidence, but I don't think it is because... It's one large element in it has been there have been the move from in poor countries to more market-based economies, particularly China, and also the opening up of trade uh, globally. This is what it's allowed people working in those economies to become much more productive because they can make stuff that's then sold to wealthy Westerners. It's precisely that same globalized market structure which has allowed people to become billionaires because the scale of their business enterprises effectively gets so much greater. So it, it, they're not merely coincidentally connected. They, they are structurally connected. And Oxfam's recommendations that we effectively you know, try to dismantle the neoliberal framework are, well, put it politely, they're perverse. Uh, to put it less politely, they are, they are, I think, perhaps unintentionally, an attack on the supposed... Uh, the beneficiaries of uh, Oxfam's charity. Yeah, the poor. 
Because if you were to pursue a quality of outcome as your main goal, it almost certainly follows that it's a race to the bottom and everyone's going to get poorer. Now, they can pat themselves on the back that there's now less of a gap between those at the top and those at the bottom, but nobody, absolutely nobody, especially the poor, are better off. No. Well, let me just, let's just be a bit concrete about this. Suppose that Oxfam had its way, and in this report they're talking a lot about wages and labor, returns to labor. They had their way, and you had to pay workers in Indonesia, let's say, Uh, the American minimum wage in U.S. dollars. Well, I can imagine a lot of low-skilled Americans liking that, but it would effectively end foreign investment in Indonesia because if you go there partly to get the cheap labor. Now, that's exploitative, people will say. No, it isn't exploitative. You go there, you offer you, these multinational companies offer the best job alternative those people have. That's why they take the jobs. Then they slowly build up their incomes. I mean, they, they can save a little. They get better off, the people working there. Competition between firms that want to access the cheap labor drive up, bid up the price of the labor. And you've already and you find that what happens over time is that skill levels in those countries go up, infrastructure improves, wages go up, and you get economic progress in the normal way. Uh, it doesn't even take that long. I mean, Oxfam's being terribly impatient. If you look at what's happened in China over the last 20 years, it's been phenomenal. And that was precisely, it wasn't so much foreign investment, there was some, but it was local investment, but they were still paying very, very low wages. And they're often, they were often providing goods for a foreign market. So, you know, there's a Chinese factory, but they're just filling orders from foreigners. By now, China is not a cheap labor market anymore. If you want to get your clothes manufactured really cheaply, you don't send them to China. China is now a high quality but reasonably expensive market. And that's happened, that transformation took two decades. The same will happen in Indonesia and Thailand and so on. If you allow the natural market process to take place, if you come in and say, oh, no, 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 you mustn't, you know, uh, in a certain sense, take advantage of your poverty. You mustn't do that. It's immoral. We don't like it. Well, you'll, you won't get the economic progress. It, it may suit your tastes. You may sit here in London feeling good about yourself because you, you, know, you crusaded to put up people's incomes. But the actual effect will be to deny those economies the capital they need and the kind of investment to make real progress. So you will harm, you will harm them. Even economists on the left for a long time have noted that things like sweatshops in Bangladesh have been an asset to those economies and to those people because as you pointed out it's much better than working on the farms and the other options that they had it tends to be much safer uh, the employees in those countries actually opt to take those jobs and it helps them on their path to industrialization and prosperity we've even had economists on the left like Paul Krugman defending that now you have Oxfam coming along and throwing that out the window I mean this is so radical actually it's purely driven by ideology. It's not driven based on the facts. And, and, and people will look at these headlines and think, oh, gosh, this is awful. We must do something. What are Oxfam's prescriptions? But Oxfam's prescriptions are extremely radical. There's a tendency for people to think that if you just command that something be, it will be. I don't know why people believe this, because it's not their own experience in their personal lives. Uh, I, I think some strange religious impulse, which, you know, religion is fading in the West, but the, the urges that are underlying the religious impulse have some of them transferred to governments. And they, they seem to be, have an ability to just decree that something will be and it will be. But it's not the case. And I think what people forget is that if you say, uh, I want you to do this, keep doing what you're doing, but on better terms for, for somebody, I want you to pay them more, I want it to be like this. Well, they'll just stop doing it. Why do poor Bangladeshis take jobs in sweatshops? Trivially, because it's their best option. If you think that this is a sad situation, it, it is. But the sad situation is that they don't have a better option. Banning the best option they have, effectively, isn't helping them. Uh, but that is what people like Oxfam are willing to do because they behold the option and they don't care for it. There is also another um, natural instinct which is at play here, which I share, which is a, um, a revulsion at what used to be called luxury. Luxury was a vice. Uh, 
Luxury was the idea of, you know, overindulging on yourself, you know, gold taps, all that kind of thing. And a lot of us, especially from a Protestant kind of background, have a visceral reaction against that kind of thing. And great wealth often bothers people. Uh, and it bothers them even if it isn't harming anybody else. Right? They just don't like it for its own sake. And I suspect that, again, there's a lot of that uh, at play in all this. But these are all trivial uh, feelings that we must resist because what matters is the welfare of the poorest people. And we have had a... The, the last 40 years has been the best ever period in the history of humanity for the welfare of the poorest. And to reject the system that brought it about is selfish and perverse. For more blogs, podcasts, films, and reports, visit our website at iea.org.uk.